Multigreen, building attainable, sustainable, and tech-enabled multifamily real estate through impact investing. Welcome to the Multigreen Podcast. I'm your host, Randy Norton, and today we'll be speaking with John Murtaugh, J.L. Murtaugh, Chris Whipple, Rob Murchison, and Dave Ray, who together make up a vital part of our Sonata One project set for development in Albuquerque, New Mexico. With over 125 years experience in the real estate industry, our six professional perspectives provide a comprehensive overview about the unique energy and technology infrastructure designed for this multi-phase development. This is the A-Team, and here is their roll call. Enjoy our conversation. Thanks for being on the podcast today, guys. Let's get into it. So I want to give a little bit of a background on why we're going into Albuquerque. This is our first case study of the podcast, and we're going to showcase our garden style product. And today we have John and JL, who are going to describe a little bit about the Sonata Trails PUD and their history there. And over this multi-decade process, we have some infill sites that we'll be constructing some multifamily product on. John, you and I met a few years ago, actually here in Henderson, Nevada. And at that time, you were telling me about this project and I just wasn't listening, but eventually we, we got around to it. We got a term sheet underway and now we have officially closed the equity. We've closed the construction loan and we'll be starting construction here in the weeks to come. Tell me and tell our listeners, why is Sonata Trails a place of interest to you and give us some history of this PUD generally. Well, first, good afternoon, Randy. This is John. We opened our division in Albuquerque back in 1995, and we began acquiring the properties that eventually became the Trails Mass Plant community in 2004. Eventually, it became a 400-acre master plant community. We've already built about 1,200 homes in the community, sold about 500 lots to other builders, and we completed a 248 rental town community about three years ago within the trails. We currently have about 40 acres left within the trails of the Plant community. And we're working with uh, Randy and Multigreen to build out the remainder of the trails with rental properties, uh, rental townhomes, and rental single family homes. The first phase we're working on is a total of 325 units, of which 300 of them will be rental townhomes, and 25 of them will be a single family detached rental homes. We've been uh, successful to date in going through all the uh, entitlement process. Uh, We're very excited because, as Randy said, that part of town is a large amount of growth. Uh, They they actually opened a new high school, new junior high school, a new grammar school in the last 10 years. And it's one of the highest rated uh, school districts in the Albuquerque area. As Randy said before in the introduction, the rental rates are growing much higher. There's a huge demand for rental housing in Albuquerque, and we'll hopefully meet the demand by building uh, three or four phases of these homes, rental homes, with Randy. Thanks for that background, John. When multi-green comes into any market, we always want to target schools, hospitals, and permanent areas of growing concern. What I really like about this Albuquerque location here at the Sonata Trails is there are brand new high schools, junior highs, and grammar schools, like John mentioned. But there's also a pending Presbyterian hospital that I think will be constructed after our multifamily divisions are complete. Is that correct, John? Yes, we sold the property to Presbyterian Hospital in 2011, in anticipation of them break ground upon the completion of the trails. I talked to them recently, and they're anticipating hopefully breaking ground on an urgent care center there within two years. They've already built five in the area over the last five years, and they know that's a growth area. So it's on their growth plan to start construction within two years of us starting this current phase. That's fantastic. And also there's other amenities in the area. Of course, you have the Petroglyph National Park, which is uh, adjacent to this property. Is that correct? Correct. The trails is called the trails. We've built about two or three miles of trails within the community. And they all end up at the uh, Petroglyph National Park. So you can walk through the trails to the park, walk through the trails to the schools, 
and uh, there's also uh, several churches on and near the site. So it's, a, it's become a very nice, close-knit community, the Trails has. And in addition to that, there's a new LDS Stake Center church. There are parks. There's even a soccer complex next to the school there with additional sporting facilities. What exactly is that, John? During the course of construction, we were required to build some detention facilities. So in lieu of having just the bare detention facilities, we built a dog run, we built a baseball field, a soccer field, and additional parks and amenities within the Trails Master Plan community. Excellent. Well, I want to pivot to JL a little bit. You are partners in crime down there. John's the father, JL's the son. I really rely heavily on both of your expertise in all of our day-to-day conversations. JL, you have a construction background, and we're looking for construction efficiencies here in even the first phase of Sonata. Tell us, what are some of the things that we're doing to be more efficient there in the first phase? Well, good afternoon, Randy. Thank you for having us on this show today. We looked at, we've been building projects in Albuquerque similar to the Sonata townhomes for about the past five or seven years. And through the course of the past 600 units we built in Albuquerque, we found several different ways of getting efficiencies up and running. The easiest one that we did is to simplify the floor plans and only have a small number of them. So with the Sonata project, we have four main floor plans and only three building types. The main purpose of that is to make sure all the subcontractors are building the same thing over and over and over again making their job at Sonata much easier to build since it's the same project over and over and over again. The second part is that once the uh, trades are comfortable with the units and they aren't changing, you're able to do a lot of bottom modularization and panelization and pre-cut and pre-manufacture a lot of their equipment, a lot of their uh, duct lines, a lot of their water lines, piping, things of that nature offsite. So when they actually get to the project, that everything goes in quickly, smoothly, and in the same place each and every time. It makes the process much easier, smoother, and less, less, much less conflicts in the field. I want to throw this question back over to you or John. But basically, from my understanding, the occupancy rates in the area of Albuquerque have been in excess of 95%. And there hasn't been a lot of new construction for multifamily. What is the closest or you know, newest product adjacent to us at Sonata? The newest project is about, probably about seven miles away uh, on Paseo de Norte. It's called Olympus North Point. That's a high-end residential community with no attached garages. They're all garden-style apartments. And there was one about a mile east of that called Marcana Apartments. And that finished about a year ago. And that is actually generating the highest rental rate in the city right now. And what about inside of this PUD wasn't the previous project? The previous project was the Cantata Apartments. That's the project that we built. We finished it in 2014. It's a 260-unit townhome community similar to Sonata, but with much earlier floor plans and not as much amenities. And how is its occupancy and uh, rental rates going right as now? As of the last week, it was about 98%, but they had just had some turnover for the annual uh, since December, and that's usually the turn time everybody was in and out in Albuquerque. But the rent rates have increased from about $1,200 a month average to about $1,400 a month average in the past year. JL, from an amenity standpoint, let's talk about Cantata. Is there anything significant that's offered there? Not typically. It's a standard hot tub pool. It has a small gym and an outdoor gazebo for a barbecue. With those simple amenities, I'm really excited to pivot to Chris on the additional amenities that we are going to start doing here at Sonata, both with Chris and Rob. But let's start with Chris. Chris, why don't we discuss a little bit about some of the energy solutions that we're bringing to the multiple phases of Sonata? Yeah, thank you for having us, Randy. You know, we're we're looking at this from a bit different angle. You know, oftentimes you're seeing a lot of energy efficiency measures going into any type of new construction these days. But the exciting thing that you're bringing to the table here uh, with the multi-green platform is that we're actually looking at how the energy is delivered to the units as well. Uh, so looking at Sonata specifically in the Albuquerque region, you know, we're evaluating some solar technologies, we're evaluating cogeneration, but the concept is that we'll be placing behind the meter uh, generating assets there on site for the tenants for their use so that their energy will actually be generated on site using, you know, 
uh, the most appropriate technology for that area. Specifically here in Sonata, we've evaluated putting in a district heating system, which is something that's very common over in Europe, but rather new here in the States. And what that is, is it's uh, basically a heating hot water loop that'll be installed along with the other utilities underground at Sonata, delivering hot water to each of these units, which can be done uh, on that basis uh, much more efficiently than we could with standard electric hot water heaters that would normally be in the garages of each of the units. So that's very exciting to be looked at, you know, but right now, uh, we're just working very closely with the utility, which is PNM, to determine what the best technology that works for the tenants, that works for the utility, and has the uh, most greenest approach to the development uh, so that we can um, generate their own electricity and their utilities on site. Chris, generally, a lot of energy is wasted in the distribution of it. In fact, isn't about 90% of all energy wasted during the distribution phase? You know, that, that's a very interesting point because the way that utilities operate now with the recent demise of coal, most utility generated electricity is generated from natural gas. You know, if you look at natural gas, you can view it as a gas that is literally just 100% energy. You know, you can burn it to cook, you can burn it in a campfire, and that heat that comes out is 100% of the energy contained within natural gas. The problem with the larger central generation uh, units that power most of our utilities is the fact that the amount of the energy in that natural gas that's actually converted to electricity is quite low. It can be as low as 30%. Uh, in some cases, you see some plants getting up to maybe a 50% efficiency, but the overall efficiency is quite low. You know, one of the technologies that we had been evaluating for Sonata is what's called cogeneration, which is a natural gas burning generator that we would place on site. But most of the energy would typically be wasted going up out of the exhaust stack we would actually recapture that energy and use it to heat the hot water loop that's going to be going in within Sonata. Uh, with that type of technology and that recycling of what's normally wasted energy, we're actually capturing anywhere from 80 to 95% of all the energy that's available within the natural gas for use on site. So it's a very efficient generation process. Excellent. And how will that benefit our residents? You know, a couple really great things here. First, with on-site generation, that provides you a little bit of redundancy. You know, uh, when big storms come through, uh, the grid can go down momentarily. Uh, in some cases, like what you've seen in California, then go down for very long periods of time. But by having some generation capability on-site, we will be able to keep uh, the most, at least the most basic amenities operating uh, within the units throughout any type of grid disturbances. But more important than that these days is the green aspect of these technologies. Everything that we're evaluating greatly reduces and in some cases eliminates the carbon footprint for the electricity that's being used on site. And so you'll find that w within the spectrum of age ranges of people that will be looking for these type of multifamily product, they're very keen on the environmental impact of how they're living. And for us to be able to provide an environment where their utilities already pre-coming with a very small environmental impact, that's just a great benefit for everybody that's involved. I appreciate that, Chris. I'm going to come back to you, but I'm going to pivot now to Rob. And Rob is with us, and he's going to discuss some of the technology standardization and information strategies that we have here at Sonata. Over to you, Rob. Excited to be here, Randy. Thank you very much. So let me sort of tee up what the construction industry has typically done over the past 100 years. And that is that, from our perspective, it has not addressed innovation at times very well. And it has not done that in an integrated approach that can be pointed to how the master format has been done in construction for decades as an example. But now what Multigreen is doing, you guys as a operating real estate operating platform are making the digital infrastructure 
something that is sitting at the same seat of the table with the other aspects of what's getting done. By that, I mean that everything, as Chris was just describing some of the innovations around energy, and as we talk about some of the innovations around the building systems, whether it be lighting or, or HVAC, to the experience that a resident will have in that unit, it's all becoming more and more digital. And with an integrated approach, that allows us to get rid of, to Chris's example earlier, a lot of waste. Because if each one of these technologies that are becoming more digital are done in their own silos, what ends up happening is that there's a lot of redundancy of that technology. And what we're doing with the multi-green approach is we're not only eliminating a lot of that redundancy so that we get more cost-effective implementations, but we also, in this world of uh, digitization, are able to embrace things such as addressing cybersecurity concerns and addressing uh, privacy because everything is converged onto a single infrastructure. Well, I know there's a lot of things that we're working on behind the scenes to standardize our technology. Here at Sonata, we're going to have at least five or six phases. How will this, I guess, technology standardization, Rob, going back to our residents, how will this benefit them? It'll benefit them in two ways, real simply, Randy. One, and most importantly, they will feel it in their pocketbook. And by that, I mean this digital infrastructure unified over one system uh, means that they aren't having to invest in things on a personal level because the digital infrastructure is there and in place. Two, and probably as or more importantly, is the experience which the residents will get in the unit and across the common areas of the property will be far superior to anything else they could have probably done on their own because they're taking advantage of a planned approach to technology versus technology being an afterthought. Rob, one more question. Is there any specific features or functions that you could describe that maybe a resident might have as he or she are walking in from their car into their unit? Can you describe that scene or that process? We could do a couple examples there. First and foremost, I think it's talk about something really simple. And that is there will not be any dead spots across this property. The resident won't have to concern themselves with that to the point that the connectivity will be ubiquitous across the property because it's been done in a planned way. Now, because of the ubiquitous connectivity that exists on the property, this allows what we would call uh, use cases of technology that would, if they were done on their own, would be somewhat uh, costly. So for instance, if the, the resident is approaching their unit and they want the oven to start up or the, the assorted music to play when they come into the unit, they want the temperature to be set at a certain temperature as, they approach, as they're going there. And they don't want to condition, they've been at work all day and they don't want to condition the unit all day. They want it to be conditioned close to when they're arriving. That can all happen automatically. We can work with them to learn their preferences over time. Will this be a single pane of glass that can be driven from one app inside of the phone of the resident? That's a real interesting question, Randy, and we've been working with your team to, yes, make that something that the resident can uh, access via the app. One of the conversations we've had to prove the point is that once you have a uh, resident on a, on a multi-green platform property, this means that they get the same experience anywhere they go, not only on that particular project, but anywhere within the multi-green platform. Well, thank you very much, Rob, for that summary. I know we could go so much into detail on any one of these topics, John, JL, Chris, and Rob, but at the end of the day, we are making green properties. And I want to pivot to Dave Ray, who's on the call here today. Dave, uh, some of the listeners may have heard him before as a featured guest, and he's been consulting with us closely on all of our green globes, lead well, fit well and Future Living Institute certification processes. 
both on the pre-construction as well as in the operations and maintenance of these buildings. So we're really excited to have Dave here today. Dave, we're doing multiple phases here in Albuquerque, as you know, at least a thousand or more units, multiple phased. How are we approaching or how are you approaching the underwriting to a green certification and what certification have we chosen and why? Thanks, Randy. You know, it's a pleasure working with this team down in New Mexico because they really understand the process. And even going through when we first talked about the requirements about energy efficiency, water efficiency, you know, this team always looked at how to solve those problems and how to get the technology and the efficiencies into the process, you know, whereas typical contractors are, don't bother me, don't bother me with that. So it's been really, really fun working with this team. Now, New Mexico, um, what we've done in all of projects throughout Multigreen is we follow a scorecard, a Multigreen scorecard that is based on LEED certification, Green Globe certification, and we'll eventually go into the well typologies. But what we've done is by developing this, we want to make sure that each property will fill the requirements for the multi-green scorecard. This multi-green scorecard is then taken down a little bit more um, finitely for each project so that we can actually see which certification is going to be fitted to get the most out of that particular project. And in New Mexico, fortunately, we have a tax credit. So what we are advising the team is to do lead for home certification down there. We're expecting the gold level. And what we're going to be able to receive is a uh, substantial tax credit when the project is complete and we file all the paperwork. So what this allows the ownership as well as the developer and the contractor to do is understand that building green, yeah, there may be a couple small adjustments at the very beginning to try to reach this lead certification for homes, but All of that is going to be paid out in a tax credit on the backside. And that's the unique concept that Multigreen has with developer contractor ownership. And that's a lot different from a lot of other contractors. And that's why I believe that in addition to this project being extremely sustainable, it's going to be very resilient and durable for the long term so that the residents truly can call this a long-term home, not just a short-term apartment. So from a certification standpoint, let's just touch base on this again. Are we doing anything with Green Globes, anything with LEED, anything with FitWell, or anything with WELL? Maybe you can just homogenize why each of those matter or don't matter when it comes to Sonata and the multiple phases we're doing there. With the the current phase, we're definitely doing LEED for homes because that's where the tax credit is available for, and that's why we chose that. Now, In addition to looking at lead for homes, we're also going through and developing a scorecard for future certifications if we decide that lead for homes is no longer going to fit future typologies, if they end up building different types of structures in the the next two, three, four phases. So right now, this uh, Sonata project is a lead for homes project. It's the highest standard in residential uh, green building certification, and we're going to be achieving the gold level. The individuals that first come onto this property are going to see a difference. They're going to want to be residents in this long-term community because of the fact that they're going to be getting more amenities. They're going to be getting uh, quite a few um, different types of digital amenities as well as they're going to have reduced expenses, which is the goal of making sure that the tenants have lower expenses on a regular basis so they can have more income to go on and enjoy their lives. And health and wellness, how are we promoting that or certifying that on the property? With health and wellness, we're looking at walkability throughout the community. We're trying to make sure that the community has a lot of amenities within it to promote that health and wellness concept. You know, when when John and JL earlier were talking about the connectivity and the actual concept of what this whole trails community is, you know, that's really what we're what we're striving for. If we can increase walkability, If we can increase daylighting, I know that we've also talked about circadian rhythm lighting in some areas, especially the community areas, then the people that are are going to be walking through this community, that are going to be habitating in this community, that are going to be enjoying this community, they're going to have less stress, they're going to have less anxiety. And, you know, when you also look at the, the VOC component with the material side of it, we're also making sure that they've got better air and, and they've got better quality of air within their homes. So although we're not quite going towards well certification with this particular project, if we did decide to make that decision, you know, this could definitely be a well certified community. I want to open up the panel just for a free conversation here for a moment. If anybody has a specific question for 
another individual. I know that Rob and Chris might have some dialogue opportunity here. And of course, if anybody has any questions for me, I'm happy to answer them as well. I, this is Rob. I'd love to just jump in and from a technology perspective, what, what Dave was just talking about, whether the lighting for the cir- circadian rhythm or m- measuring the, the health and wellness, those are t- at least two examples of something that's dependent on a technology. And by approaching technology in a standardized way, this digital infrastructure, we're going to reduce a lot of the, I'll say the frustration, but more importantly, the economic cost associated with bringing those technologies into an operational environment, essentially de-risking technology and making it an asset versus a liability. Thanks, Rob. Anybody else have any thoughts or questions that they want to add to the conversation? I have one more question, not to hog the conversation, but uh, when Chris is talking about, Chris, when you're talking about the microgrid that you're putting on property, are, you're going to have the ability to not only deliver AC, but also DC power. Is that correct? In some cases, yes. You know, it's not fully designed out yet. Uh, typically, the power will be distributed throughout the facility uh, at AC, at medium voltage. Uh, but we are looking at some DC applications, both on the genera- generation side and the local delivery side as well, too. So my point there is, as, as this digital infrastructure gets more and more feature rich, um, we're going to be able to leverage that DC power to energize these devices at an even more cost-effective pace or cost-effective approach. That's true. And I think you just hit on a pretty important point is that this is this is a work in progress, you know, and one of the things that we've all been very smart about is that there's a lot of data here that we'll be collecting that will enable us to improve our product going into the future. I know from our perspective on the metering side, uh, you know, we're, of course, gathering electrical usage from each of the residences. But we're bringing in new technology that will actually be able to log what the electrical use is of each appliance and each electricity user, computer, hair dryer, whatever it may be within each of the units. And this amount of data is really going to be able to help us to fine tune the offering that we provide to uh, the Sonata as we work through the phases and completely build out the product. And I know, Rob, on your side, we'll be collecting a lot of data there as well, too, so that we can continuously refine our product as we move forward. And we've spent a lot of time on privacy laws. And Rob, with your group, we've been spending a lot of time and money and effort with our legal counsel. We're very sensitive about that. We don't even know what data we're collecting yet or how we're going to store it, but we know at a future time it could be valuable for us in the future design of these assets. So essentially, you know, we have multiple data clouds and multiple cloud environments, but we also have a data lake that, you know, we want to have some guidance on. Rob, what is our takeaway on privacy here? I think the takeaway on privacy is that there is a balance between privacy and preferences. And in order to intelligently impact the built environment in which the residents will live, work, and play, you want to be able to help understand their preferences so that they can have a better experience. The flip side of that is that data needs to be gathered in order to automate some of the experiences around those preferences. What we are working very diligently with some world-class attorneys is to make sure that in no way do we impede upon the privacy of the resident so that they know when they rent from a multi-green platform project, they can be rest assured that they're getting the upside of preferences without the downside of privacy leaks. I really appreciate that. John and JL, when you hear all of this, are you rolling your eyes or are you smiling? Are you saying, gosh, I'm concerned? You know, we've been working together for a very long time, but how is this being received on your end? It's a very good question, Randy. On our end, it's more of a, and this is definitely something that's new to us, but we're very excited to learn more as we go through the process. As long as all our tenants' rights are respected, And they get the benefit of all this additional technology, lower power bills, more efficient units, and potentially lower rent than the competitors. It's a win-win for everybody. Is there anybody in the market today that is doing something similar that you're aware of in Albuquerque? Or is there any green 
building competition that we might have from a multifamily standpoint? From our side, we don't see it yet in the public market. We've seen several federally funded projects, but I think we'll be the first privately funded market uh, community with the gold standard for lead in Albuquerque. If I remember right from a previous conversation that we had, I believe we're the first lead homes gold multifamily project in the state of New Mexico. Does anybody, can anybody verify that on the call? We are, as of for a, for a free market, yes. There was one assisted living, a federally funded project that was gold, but it wasn't on the open market. So we're the first private uh, enterprise with gold lead a residential in New Mexico. Wonderful. So here we are, December 30th. We're at the end of our very first year of operations at Multigreen. I want to give you each one last comment as to where you see us going in the next year here at Sonata. John and JL, what can we expect over the next 12 months? Well, from our side, uh, we've been working with you already for a while now. What we like about working with Multigreen is that we can solve problems outside the box. And when in a green environment, we also can take advantage of new technology that eventually makes the construction even less expensive. So it's a combination of giving additional uh, economies to the actual people living in our communities by low power uh, costs and also low construction costs, both in and outside of green between ourselves and MG, we resolve to make things better. And sometimes making things better also makes it less, less expensive to build. That's a great point. JL, what do you see for the next 12 months? On our end, I'm, my, our team is going to be focused on getting the first units up and running, getting the, the getting the club sense clubhouse and the recreational center and the pool up and running for that first project and moving on to the next phases. How many units will we have under CFO by this time next year? We should have approximately between 120 and 150 units ready for uh, either having tenants moved in or getting ready to move in for the first phase of Sonata. Excellent. Chris, where are we going to be this time next year? I think the exciting thing about this program is that we're really kind of building a movement here. You know, right now we're building 250 some odd units with the first phase of Sonata, but ultimately we're building 40,000 units. And so what we're focusing on over the next 12 months is building out this programmatic approach to be able to provide the right type of energy for each of these units. This is truly big. 40,000 units, this is enough that not only are we eventually going to see large economies of scale in pricing and installation, but you're going to see that this is going to move the industry quite a bit in the distributed generation world. Building out this much microgrids as part of one program hasn't been done before. And once it comes out, what we're going to do, uh, you're going to see um, our needs driving the technology instead of the other way around. And we should start seeing some of those effects here by the end of this next year. That's great insight. Thanks, Chris. And Rob, on your side, what do you see happening and where are we going to be this time next year? Let me sort of tee up by saying this. Traditionally, technology was treated in a silo by big technology companies. And, and as we talk here, Cisco, one of the largest technology companies in the world, backed out of the smart city space yesterday. And the reason they, they were not succeeding is they're not a real estate operating company. What we will be able to do at Sonata is through an integrated team, have our demands drive the technology, as Chris said, versus the other way around. One of the biggest challenges about technology in the real estate space, commercial real estate space, is it requires a lot of skill. And John, you brought up the example of, of I believe it was prefabrication earlier. And what we're going to do, the equivalent in technology, is we're going to do as much of the skilled technology labor off-site. So when that technology shows up, it's plug and play. And that's going to be a big deal and transformational in this industry. Thanks, Rob. And Dave, where do you see us being more efficient? And where do you see us being 12 months from now here in Sonata? You know, what I see, just like uh, everybody, all the other participants, is this is going to change the game. When you are building projects that are more efficient, that are cheaper and as far as operating costs for the residents, then everybody has to follow suit. 
you know, currently when somebody goes down to buy a car and they have a certain budget, they look and see what are the maintenance costs going to be? What, how many miles per gallon? And although we're not quite there yet because there's not enough good competition to actually judge operating expenses, quality of life, et cetera, et cetera, this is going to set the bar down in New Mexico. So what I foresee is as soon as this project's complete, it'll be 100% occupied quickly, probably before construction is completed, and everybody else is going to start taking note of let's put better technology, let's, let's care about the health and wellness just like multi Well, I'm really excited to see the future development here in Sonata, in Albuquerque. Thank you, everybody, for being on the podcast today. I hope this helps our listeners understand a little bit more how we're thinking about ground-up construction for multifamily units in a garden-style community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Randy. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for listening. Join us as we build 40,000 attainable, sustainable, and tech-enabled multifamily homes by 2030. And if you like the content you're hearing, hit the subscribe button. Follow us at Think Multigreen and sign up to learn more at www.multi.green.